Welcome back to Season 2 of the Discount Property Investor Podcast. Our mission is to share with you what we have learned from our experience and the experience of others to help you make more money investing like a pro. We want to teach you how to create wealth by investing in real estate the Discount Property Investor way. Make sure you never miss an episode and download the Discount Property Investor app in Google Play or iTunes today. To jumpstart your real estate investing career, visit freewholesalecourse.com, the most complete free course on wholesaling real estate ever. Thanks for tuning in. All right, guys, welcome back to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. This is your host, as always, David Dodge. My co-host, Mike Slane, is in the field today looking to buy us a couple more rental properties. I am joined by a good friend of mine who I recently was had the pleasure to meet and we kicked it off. We were actually wingmen. Yeah, wingmen. Wingmen at a mastermind yeah. that we attended down in Tulum, Mexico. So Sharad Meta is my co- is my host. Sharad, how yeah. are you today, brother? Good man, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I really wanted to get you on the show because you the, the way that you invest in real estate, the 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 strategy that you have used it blew my mind when you had first told me about it because, and I, and I know you work very hard, of course, but you seem to work a little bit smarter than most people. Um, and the reason I say that is because you flip houses. You, 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 I'm sure you do lots of wholesaling, but your main business is like the full rehab in retail, yeah. correct? Yeah, pretty much. However, you don't live where you do this at. I don't. So before we jump into all that, because that's, I mean, that's, that alone is just awesome. I, I think it's going to make for a great show. But before we get into all that, how did you get in, in, um, your start in real estate investing? What was it that triggered you to jump in? Have you always been doing it? How long? You know, so and so. No, so I, I bought my first property back in 2010, August yeah. 2010. I used to work at an accounting firm back then. So I was doing number crunching and, you know, I'd always saved them some money. So my wife and I, we always lived on lower of the two incomes and saved the higher income. So we had some money saved up. Both of us were working, making decent salary. I want to uh, stop you right there because that's already uh, some good information. So you have, you and her have always lived off of the lower of the two incomes and yeah. saved the higher one. Yeah. That's awesome. Just in itself, Sharad. that's awesome. Yeah, no, I mean that honestly, that's kind of, I mean, that's always been our mantra. We both come from very, you know, financially conservative families. So we've always said, you know, the, the higher income um, and lived on the lower one. That's so, cool. So we had some money. You your first house in 2010? 2010, we paid cash for it. It was listed for 65, two unit property, listed for 65. I think I paid 22 or 25, put another 10, 15 into it. So all in for about 35. Rented both unit outs for like six fifty each. So I was getting thirteen hundred. This was while I was still working. I'm like, holy crap, this is pretty amazing. You know, there's like no way I can lose money doing this. So that was like August twentieth, two thousand ten, or something around there. And September of two thousand ten, I bought another three unit, which was I bought it for forty four, put about five into it or six into it. I was all in for about fifty, no more than fifty five, and. For those three units, I, I still own both those properties. I was getting a rent of about sixteen or seventeen hundred a month. So wow, I'm like, this is, for fifty. Yeah, I'm like, this is, yeah, I'm like, this is pretty incredible. You that's know, three percent rule right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some I had like four percent. I think. I mean, I bought. I think third or fourth property I bought. Three unit I bought for twenty eight thousand. Put seven into it, so I was all in for thirty five, and I was I still own that property. I get about eighteen hundred month rent for that eighteen or nineteen hundred. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, values have gone up. You know, it's not thirty five anymore. It's worth forty thousand maybe. Right, right. But the yeah. cash flow is, is yeah, good. cash flow is ridiculous. Yeah. So, Sharad, where do you live right now? I live in North San Diego. Uh, North in San Diego. Carlsbad. So it's San Diego County, but 45 minutes north of the city of San Diego. Okay. I so, in, so you're not quite halfway to, to LA. You're cl- way closer to the San Diego. Oh, yeah, definitely way closer to San Diego. Cool, yeah. cool, cool. Yeah. And what market are you flipping houses in? 
I am right outside of Chicago, but in Indiana. Okay. So it's the area is called Northwest Indiana. I'm in Lake County. It's okay. population about four hundred to five hundred thousand people. So it's, why did you choose that market? I used to live in Chicago, so I've been living in San Diego for about four years, but I used to live in Chicago, so that's. Did you live there a long time? Uh, I lived there for, I guess, if you look at my real estate investing career, I lived half life in there Chicago. You so you're very well aware of Chicago suburbs and... and Not like, Chicago, but Indiana. Like, Indiana, okay. Did yeah. you live on the Indiana side when you were in Chicago or, or no? No, I wasn't smart enough, so I was living in Chicago side. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Yes. So how many houses do you have going right now? Uh, we have... 13 flips as of right now. Man, that is insane. So you live in San Di northern San Diego. You yeah. flip houses in the Midwest. Right. Just outside of Chicago in, the, in, in Indiana. 13 right. projects at the moment. How right. many do you think you're, you're doing? Uh, how many do you think you did in 2018? About 50. About 50. Now, how much rehab are you, are you doing into each of these? Are you... Now, again, your business is primarily, I'm under right. the impression, so again, fill me in, flipping to where you rehab yep. to retail, right? Yep. And I'd imagine you come across deals that you wholesale just because you get them. Like they kind of fall, yeah. in, they fall in your lap whenever you're doing what you're doing, which is really cool. So how many do you think you did in 2018? About 50? Yeah. An average rehab minimum is 20,000, mm -hmm. right? In terms, of, in terms of net profit? Oh, are you talking profit? I was talking like actual rehab. Okay, no, that's that's oh. why I was asking. So you're talking about the cost to fix. Cost to fix is about twenty thousand minimum, okay. mm -hmm. and on the high end, sixty to seventy-five thousand. So some of these are pretty big rehab, like foundation. Yeah, work. Sixty, seventy grand. That's a good size rehab for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and some of these like we're doing right one right now. We're doing foundation work, um, and then you know the cool thing is, so out of the fifty houses that we flip. I think I personally stepped my foot in less than five of them. <laughs> okay, we're going to get to that. That's, yeah. that's cool. So before we get into that, why real estate? What, was, like, what did you do or read or talk? Who did you talk to? Who, what was the reason that you got into this? Was it because you, you know, bought that first rental and then just decided this is cool, I like the business because you said you had a job when you bought that first yeah, one, right? Yeah, I mean, I had my job when I bought the first two properties. I left my job when I had the third property under contract, which was four unit, but it fell through. Anyway, so, uh, you know, like I said, my wife and I, we've always lived on lower of the two income, save the higher one. So we had some money saved up. And I'm, I'm not as much, but I used to be a lot into personal finance. I would read a lot about Susie Orman, Dave Ramsey, you know, kind of just be obsessed with that. Um, yeah, you wanted to be financially literate. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I used to read a lot of books, you know, and I used to follow a lot of uh, online personal finance blog. So I would invest my money in stocks and bonds. And, you know, when I was doing it myself, I was like absolutely terrible at it. I lose money on practically every single stock. Frustrating. It is, man. It is. So I, I should have been like, hey, I want to invest in this stock. I should have just actually sold it and made more money. But so I lost, I lost some money in it. And I'm like, you know what? This, this is not working out. I got to do something else with the money that I have. So, and I wanted to do something where I could have control of the asset. You know, with the stocks right. and bonds, I, I controlled the transaction part, but I didn't have yeah. any control. You can't, the you can't affect the top exactly. line or the exactly. bottom line. Exactly. You're yeah, like you, a shareholder. Yeah. Like, like, let's say I own some stuff. And I'm like this, this big of a shareholder. Oh, man, it's less yeah. than that. Let's, let's say I was to go out and, and buy $10,000 right. worth of, worth of Coca-Cola stock. Right. Right. Me going to the grocery store and buying Coca-Cola for lunch every day. Right. Going to move that stock. Which is, by the way, not very healthy for you. <laughs> yeah. I don't drink, I don't drink yeah. soda. Right. Yeah. But the point is, is that you, you don't have the control. And I love that yeah. you brought that to, you know, to the attention of the listeners and the viewers here because you don't, you know, it's, I don't like to say it's buy and pray, but I mean, what, how else do you look at it? You know? Yeah, you don't, you, you're right, man. You don't, you don't know what's going on. You don't know who's making the decision that's going to control your, your network. So that was, that was frustrating. You know, there's like so much going on with stock market that I honestly didn't know what the hell I was doing. 
So, you know, at that point, I was reading a lot of personal finance blog and actually somebody, it, it's funny that I was reading, you know, for some reason I love, enjoy, I think it's most all of the people. I enjoyed reading comments more than the actual blog, just to see, you know, what other people had to say about it. Somebody actually posted a link to this book called Flip. Uh, by Nick Ruiz? I don't even know. It had like a blue cover. Uh, was it was it thin, kind of thin, like 60, 70 pages? No, no, it was it was okay. a thick book. different book then. Okay, I own a bunch of them. That's, yeah, it was like a different book. Have that flip of the word. So okay, go ahead, go on. Yeah, so I bought that book, and you know how you go on Amazon, it shows like customers also bought this, and there was another book that came up as suggestion like how to be how to be a millionaire real estate investor by uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Jerry Keller. Jerry Keller. I, mm -hmm. I think he was the author. So I read. The, I mean, I'm I'm reading that. I'm like. That's exactly what I want to be. I want to be a millionaire in real estate. Is I want to be an investor, right? Yeah. So I bought that book. Um, I read it. I'm like, wow, this is exactly what I want to do. I had some money saved up, so I started buying real estate. Love it, love it. So let's talk more about the flipping business. So you have 13 going on. You did 50 last year. You walked in. You said like less than five ish, yeah. roughly. So you do this virtually. So. I don't know if I mentioned this yet because we talked a little before we started recording the episode here, but we've mentioned obviously that you live in two different places or you live in San Diego and you do this in, um, Midwest. Say that again. In Midwest, you know, in Indiana. You invest in a, yeah, in a different market. Um, so how does that work? Cause like how many, let's start here. How many days are you in Indiana a month on average? And I get some months you're going to be there a lot more. Other months, you may not be there as often. But let's say, you know, since you started investing or over the maybe the last, you know, year or so, how many days a month do you do you spend in that market? No more than three days a month. No more than three days a month. So I'd right. imagine that you've built out a pretty amazing team right. um, to help you with that. Because if I only work three days a month, I, I mean, it's not that I work three days a month. No, no, no. no. I, let, me, let me correct. Let me correct right. myself. I, I'm, I'm, I actually work two setup. days a month, so I just. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, if I was only in my office, which is where my business consists of, three days a month, you know, it would be tough. So you just you're only in that market for no more than three days in a month. Right. However, you just do everything virtually. So you are right. flipping houses virtually but in a different context than how most people look at it. Most people say, or when they, get, when they want to become a virtual wholesaler, for example, they're marketing in a foreign market, just not right. their own, and they're finding buyers and they're linking them up, but you're actually purchasing these houses in a different market, right. putting 20 to 70 grand on average into them, yeah. and then flipping them off. And then what, what kind of profits do you estimate, or I shouldn't say estimate, what's the goal? With, with the profits on a, on a house? Like what's the average? What are you shooting for? Some of our low-end houses about, you know, minimum we look for about 15 to 20. I'm, I'm talking like these are houses that we sell for less than 100,000. Sure. Right? Okay. So your purchase, your purchase is, is between 50 and 20 ideally? Uh, purchase would be about like 40 to 50,000. Okay. You know, we'll put about 20, 30 into it. So our net profit should be minimum, should be about 15,000. This is like I'm talking... After you know, uh, holding costs like you know, Interest any expense, closing, exactly. any any cost that can be directly allocated, to anything that is going to come out of your pocket, Absolutely. right? Okay, so, yeah, and then on high end, uh, you know, on like some of the properties that are bigger rehabs, our profit expectation would be about uh, twenty-five to thirty minimum. Got it. So fifteen on the smaller end. 25 to, th and that's, uh, that's about right in line. I'm in the Midwest too. I'm in yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I imagine your market and my market is very, very similar. Very. Yeah. I'd imagine. So mine's a little bigger, but right. it's very similar. Yeah, very Absolutely. similar in terms of demographic and you know, in terms of property type and whatnot. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's kind of the market we're in. So tell me a little bit about the team and then I'm going to ask you a little bit about like what you're looking for as well as uh, what kind of marketing you're doing. So let's start with the team. Like, what does your team consist of? Because I would love to only come in the office three days a month. I mean, obviously, I, I would work from home with my laptop and, and my cell phone or just anywhere in the world. I mean, right. essentially, you don't have to um, – if you're only spending three days in your market, of course, you're working. 
uh, right. when you're not there. But you don't have to be in northern San Diego. You could be in the south of Spain or in yeah, Russia. You know, you be anywhere. You know, one of the, the, the craziest closings I've done, I sold a property while I was in Tanzania, in Africa. <laughs> there yeah. you go. That's what I'm saying. No, my, my dad used to live there. So my wife and I, we went on an African safari. And we, had safari. To we literally, I mean, that was, that was an interesting process to get documents notarized in Africa. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. So. That was interesting. Yeah. That's uh, cool though, man. Like, you know, you can't do that with a nine to five. Like that's no, you can, man. You can. I mean, that was the whole point of, you know, just being financially free at an age. And, and I started out buying rental properties. It's actually only in the last three or four years that I've been pretty active in flips, but I did start out buying rental properties. So I own about 75 and, and the majority of them are paid for. So that's, that was kind of my base was to start out buying rental properties and have a base, you know, okay, if anything goes wrong, at least have this much money coming in on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's kind of how we started. Are most and, of your rental properties, are they multis or singles or you have a mix? Uh, I would say most of them are single family houses. Mm -hmm. I did start out buying two to four units, uh, but towards, you know, I get the second half of my buying rental property like after first couple of years i started buying more single family than multi-units sure. just because the area that i was buying and it didn't have many multi-units predominant 95 percent single family houses right okay so again i don't want to get too granular i don't, um, i mentioned that from the get-go but how do you find these houses to flip like 50 houses in a year that requires a lot of marketing efforts to yeah be, so you know i mean you know, whenever you're real estate investing and you're going direct to the seller, there's lots right. of ways to get a house, right? But there's right. only so many ways to get a deal, right? right? Typically, you go direct to the seller. You avoid the commissions. Right. You avoid agents, which I don't want to say negative things about agents, but they often get in the way in our business. They can I mean, be agents, very helpful. They can no, be agents helpful. know that. Agents they also. know that, but they get in the way. And then right. one of my pet peeves, is whenever I'm selling a house is that I have to pay the buyer's agent. Right. The job is to get the best deal for the buyer. Right. It's like, it's so counterintuitive it that is. I have to pay them to right. argue with me. That's right. their job, right? right? So what are you looking for and how do you find these deals? So we do tons of direct mail. Uh, we send about, 40 to 50,000 mailers and not every month, every six weeks now. Okay. So that's what we do, we do PPC, mm -hmm. uh, we do text messaging. We are starting to do ringless voicemail. I'm not hundred percent sure if we'll continue with that. Mm -hmm. We did cold calling. We picked up one deal from that. We, and we buy a few houses from referral. Yeah. Okay. So that's you guys good. are doing a lot of marketing. It's probably weighted what 70 to 80% mail. Yeah. Yeah. Give or, give or yeah. Take. Yep, exactly. You guys are doing a lot of mail. And then what are you, what are you looking for, for both um, when determining who to mail? And then on the flip side, once, you know, you get the phone ringing, like what's, what makes a good, uh, a good deal for you other than just highly motivated? Like, you know, obviously as real estate investors, we want to, like I just said, we want to go direct to the seller. Right. You want to solve a problem. So, you know, somebody told me this the other day, and I didn't look at it this way, but as a real estate investor, specifically a wholesaler, but same for you, um, for the rehabs, is, you know, our service um, is providing um, ease of use and or a quick close, but in return, we're asking for a low price, right? right. So, um, what are you looking for? Let's start with this, when you're, whenever you're determining who to market to. Is it high equity? High equity. Okay. Basically, anybody with high equity, we market to them. High equity in five years of ownership. Five years of ownership with high equity. That's yeah. I love it. It's so simple. Right. It's nothing crazy. Now, do you guys also buy lists that are more targeted for potential distress along the lines of like probate or divorce, et cetera, et cetera? We don't, but we are. That's something we are going to look into it just so that we can list stack it, right? Um, so list that if you know, sure. if doesn't know it's basically like if you have, if you have, uh, a seller showing up in your high equity list, they're showing up in your tax delinquent list, they're showing up in your divorce list and, you know, probate list, then, you know, they're showing multiple signs of motivation. So 
with that would be we target them few different ways we we cold call them we send them a text message we drop the ringless voicemail but everybody else that's on a big equity list we're dropping uh, direct mail to them direct mail to them on a couple of different lists and we can target them a couple of other ways so okay yeah, that is our goal is to start looking into that so then on the flip side though so that's great thanks for sharing Right. Um, and I get, I, I like that we're big picture on this. So then on the flip side, the phone starts ringing. So what makes that particular, um, lead? Obviously I can answer this for you. Motivation is the first thing right. I'm sure you're looking for, but once they start talking about the house, you know, are you, so you're obviously, I would imagine also looking for ones that meet your criteria of low end purchase maybe from what 40 to 50 60 grand that need about right. to work so you guys aren't looking to buy houses that need more work than the purchase price right uh we would i mean i'm buying a house tomorrow or thursday for sixty five hundred dollars so it's gonna need more than sixty five hundred dollars sure, sure. Uh, but but i you know i mean we bought we bought other houses we are looking at buying another one for thirty thousand it's gonna need forty thousand into it okay so so in terms of like what houses we would buy, they need to have motivation, obviously, and they need to have equity. Mm -hmm. so if they okay. have high motivation, but no equity. Then so that's one thing that I had left out is the right. equity, but that's right. like, I don't know why I forgot that. That's the most important part because right. you can't, I shouldn't say can't, it makes it more difficult to get a good deal if there's right. no equity. I've right. had sellers bring 40, 50 grand to the table to right. see a deal, wow. but that's rare. You That's know, we yeah. I once had two sellers bring forty grand or more in the same week. Wow, it was crazy! But I've and, only had that happen a few times where they bring that much, right. right? Right. So yeah, I totally discounted equity, but equity is so huge. So high motivation, they have to have equity. Right. Is there any um, particular type of house up in Indiana or area that you guys, you know, either avoid and or like better than the other areas? Like Gary, Indiana, for example, we don't really buy anything there. You know. Now, why is that? It just it's really run down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really run down, so we don't we don't buy. No anything. appreciation in that part of the of the of the. Yeah, no, and it's not it's not even no appreciation. It's just it's it's a D class neighborhood. We have an in house property management company, and then you know we have we have three people in our property management, and they're all female. So you know we kind of just look out for their safety. We don't want to buy in an area where you know. I wouldn't want to go like, I don't want anybody else to go there. So we don't yeah. buy there. There are some sections of the city where we would buy, but right. that's a very small section. So we pass on a lot of properties in that area. So pretty much if, if it fits, so let's say if it fits the area we're buying, they have motivation, they have equity, then we'll buy anything. Like there's no project that we'll walk away from. I love that. Okay, cool. Hey, we got to circle back to the team. We kind of skipped over that. Yeah. So you have to have a team. Yep. In order to A, only spend three days a month in the market, but B, to be able to walk less than five houses out of 50 that you flipped. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the team, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, sure. We'd all love to hear it. The listeners and viewers, and of course myself, I'm interested too. So what's so the have my, of how many people and what do they do? So I have my office manager slash integrator. She actually lives in California. She lives okay. about half hour from where I live. Mm -hmm. We don't see each other that much. We see, I think we've seen each other once this year, I believe. Um, so she How long has she been with you? She's been with me for about three years now, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, almost three years. So she has been to Indiana two or three times. That's it? Uh, yeah, she only goes to attend the holiday party. Okay, okay. Like once a year, we do a holiday party for our contractors and everybody. Right. So that's the only time she's been there. But she's actually going there next week. I'm going to be in Indiana next week. So I asked her to come because we hired a new person. So, so she would be what you would call my office manager slash integrator. And then I have a project manager in Indiana. Then I have an acquisition manager. And we have a, a virtual assistant in Philippines. And then we have a bunch of contractors. That right. Work. So the contractors, I, I love that you're including them on the team. Um, but regardless of the contractors, the core, because those people are just, they're contractors. They, they get paid on a contract. It's project by project. Right, right? but, but it, it's a little bit different. So like these guys, the, the people that we've been working with, they have, you know, like I've been working with them for about four years now, four or five years. So 
ninety percent of the work that they do is for us. Okay. Like, so for guys, so let's say they get ten ninety nine at the end of the year, they're getting you know pretty much one ten ninety nine because from us, they don't right. get anything else. So right. Okay. So, but you know, but they're, they're contractors, but they are kind of like part of our. So team. they're kind of part of the. I mean, they're part of the team for sure. Right. But you're not restricting them from taking a side project or. Work right. no, no, we're not. Because again, you're, it's a project by project. So what I was getting at though, is I wasn't discounting the contractors as being part of the team. Don't take that the wrong way. Yeah. And I know you're not, but what I was getting at though, is that your team isn't 12 people. It's, right? um, it's four, yeah. it's four, four. So it's you, your office manager, you have an acquisition manager, right? And then you have a virtual assistant in the Philippines. Right. So we just what, came on a couple of months ago. Awesome. The VA we just brought in a couple of months ago. Now are they full time? They are full time, right? So what does the what does the um, office manager do? What's their kind of core duties? Obviously, the acquisition person is in charge of I would think walking homes and writing right. contracts, making offers, doing due diligence. So what does the office manager do? And then what do you have the virtual assistant doing? And again, I have virtual assistants. I have an office manager, but a lot of our listeners and viewers that you know probably have that nine to five right. that are interested there you know they don't know so uh, you know give me a quick uh, rundown on what those people do for you and why you have them so let's say lead comes in the virtual assistant what you do is you'll see a lead come in and if it's if somebody's just calling in like you know on mail hit today so we had like 20 people call in uh today and majority of them hey take me off the list of work so she's going in she's updating our CRM. and then this is the office manager this is the virtual assistant. Oh, this is the virtual assistant. I'm sorry. Okay. The virtual okay. assistant. Okay. So, so the calls are going to the virtual assistant. Uh, no. So the calls go to Pat Life. Are they going to Pat? No matter what? No matter what. 24-7. Okay. 24-7. All wow. calls go to Pat Life. Okay. Right? We get an email from them. So virtual assistant will look at the email and she will, you know, based on the information we have, she'll go and update the CRM. If it's somebody who wants to be taken off the list, she'll go move them to dead lead and then she will remove them from our mailing list. Okay, so that's what she'll do. And so then clean it, the list up. Clean the it. list, clean the CRM. Got it. Okay. And then if it's somebody motivated, she's gonna update the lead information and let the acquisition manager know, hey, this is a good lead. Acquisition manager is also getting the same emails from Hatlife, but we just had this call this morning with our acquisition manager and a VA that the acquisition manager, we're paying her, we want her to just focus on getting deals done you know it's not the best use of her time to to vet them to qualify exactly or update the crm you know nobody and that too them. that's a time right. consuming thing absolutely exactly. i try to spend as little amount of time in my crm as i possibly can right. however it's almost impossible to not be in there for an hour or two a day no matter exactly. what but the exactly. least amount of so i just did a podcast right before i had you on i was actually the guest on a buddy of mine's podcast joe mccall and um he always says, show me a, an expert at a, at, the, at a CRM and I'll show you a broke real estate investor. And I love it though, because if that's what you're doing all day, spending all your time in there, you can't do other things. So I love that you've outsourced that to a virtual assistant. Sometimes, I mean, we, sometimes we developed our own CRM also. So it's that, delegation. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm huge on delegation. And then one, another thing that, you know, we try to be really good at is like, we all focus on our one thing in the business. Okay. You know, like mm -hmm. my acquisition manager, she brings the most value to the company by getting deals done. Right. You know, she doesn't bring value to the company by updating CRM. Okay. Same thing with my project manager. She brings the most value to the company by making sure our projects are done on time within budget. That's it. Like if she could do one thing in a business, that's what she's going to do. So we kind of, you know, we, we try to be super focused on what's our one thing in the business is. My one thing in the business is to make sure that we're growing enough. So everybody in the business has work to do, you know, whether it's a contractor, it's my project manager, acquisition manager. So that's kind of my one thing to make sure. You have five people in the company, right? Four, four people, not including yourself. Correct. So if you include yourself, then it would be five. I got you. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. And then Pat Live is our answering service. So anyway, the lead comes in, the VA would update the CRM, and then we have a WhatsApp group where if it's a good lead or whatnot, then the VA will send a notification to the acquisition manager saying, hey, you know, we have a good lead come in, just kind of 
uh, see what's going on. And then the acquisition manager would go on an appointment and she would just stay focused on making sure deal. Get deal done. Mm -hmm. Any notes that she has from the appointment, she'll leave a voice note on WhatsApp. The VA will update the CRM based on that. I do the same thing. We use Slack. Same, it's just right. a yeah, same, same system. Yeah. Right. Um, but I do the same thing. I just use dictation, which is probably right. a worse way to do it than you're doing. Right. Because I got to go in and I got to edit it once it's done. But at least I can do it while I'm driving. Right. And yeah. Send it over to the VA and say, update this lead, create a task to follow up in six weeks or whatever right. the, that exactly. number might be. Okay. So all right. calls go to Pat Live. You have a VA to clean the list and clean the CRM. Then yeah. it goes to the acquisition manager, assuming that they're motivated and have equity, which we talked about earlier. Right. And then the acquisition manager's job, correct me if I'm wrong, is to go build rapport, walk the property, maybe get yep. pictures, make an offer. Right. And then they then, so then once the offer's made, who follows up with these people? Because we both know that a lot of these deals take time for either the seller's motivation to change right. or for them to just realize that they need to sell and that you're going to solve their problem. So does the VA do the follow-up or is that the acquisition manager? No, once, once acquisition, I mean, if the property comes in, you know, where we have made an offer or we have uh, the property in the contract, then the, the acquisition manager will follow up on that. Okay. Unless, unless, you know, they go MIA, then our VA will like drop them text, text messages. or RVM or whatever. But as long as they're being responsive, then our acquisition manager will stay in touch with them because, you know, like my acquisition man manager is the one who's paid to report with them. So we want to make sure that that continues. Got it. Okay. Right. So then after you guys get a property right. under contract, either by the acquisition manager or the efforts of a VA following up, because it could go both ways. Right. Um, then I would imagine your office manager kind of steps in to coordinate closing and funding and, and to talk to the seller because you guys aren't, I would imagine you're doing some wholesaling, but most of these acquisitions, I would think, correct me if I'm wrong, would be for you to rehab and retail yes. or yep. just buy the rental, right? Is that do yeah, you yeah. rentals yeah. in that market too? So you're marketing for multiple purposes. Correct. Correct. So 90% awesome. of- and why wouldn't you? What was that? And why wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, 90% of what we buy would we have. Yeah, multiply the efforts of the marketing into, you know, right. different types of uh, exit strategies. I love that. So then the office manager comes in and then they coordinate closing and funding and all the above. And then you push it off to the project manager, right? Yep, exactly. Hey, you got a good system here, Sherrod. I love this. Okay. So then the project manager, they work with the... Um, the contractors, the contractors to kind of right. figure out. So at what point um, do you do anything? <laughs> That's a joke, of course, but I love no, you know, you're in charge of the marketing and then just managing the people because I love that you've delegated it. And I didn't mean that right. as an insult. Like, no, 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 I'm jealous. Right. I want to do that too. That's great. Right. Like this, this year I've been to Indiana four times Okay, and I haven't actually gone no i've actually gone to one house and i haven't gone into any other house it was one house we bought through online auctions so i just kind of wanted to check it out sure uh, so yeah i mean so I, you have a dialed in acquisition manager that essentially knows a what you're looking for they're all you guys are only getting calls m most of the time unless it's bad data from high equity individuals that have motivation or right that you assume they do um, your acquisition manager knows what to look for and what to make offers on. And I'd imagine that took a little bit of time to train and, and get that dialed in, but you have it dialed in. So um, my, just my acquisition manager and my project manager, they're both licensed agents and my helps. project manager is licensed contractor also. Oh, cool. Okay. So you, so like in the state of Missouri, you don't have to be a licensed contractor. You have to do that in Indiana. You have to actually be a licensed contractor. I know in Florida, they require that. Licensed contractor for, to pull permits and stuff? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So in the state of Missouri, anybody can pull them. However, you have to have the licensed individual, like a plumber, electrician, HVAC, so on and so forth, sign off on them. But I could go up to the, you know, the, the local city or county office and get the permit. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, it's a little different here. Mm -hmm. Well, it is different. Yeah, no. So we we pull our own permits. Like we have a licensed plumber, electrician, HVAC guy that we work with. But for sure. carpentry work, like roofing, siding, we pull our own permits. 
Got it. Okay, cool. So then the project manager and the office manager are both licensed. Right. Okay. So once the project manager gets the gets the handoff from the office, excuse me, from the office manager, then their job is to work with the contractors to get the houses ready Correct. to be sold. So, so the it, project manager would get involved, you know, during the acquisition stage if it looks like it's a good. So we have we have to kind of start prepping. Exactly. So in, in our in our WhatsApp, we have an acquisition group. So it's my VA is on that group, my acquisition manager and my project manager. So acquisition manager will go out, make a so video. They're all talking all day, basically. All, everyone's communicating about what's maybe going to be in the pipeline or what's coming up. Correct. And then everybody's on the same system. So as you know, we developed our own platform. Yep. So we have, you know, everybody from our VA to acquisition to project are in the same system. So our, our leads and our inventory, everything stays in the same system. So we can we can go in, like we have tasks set for everybody here. This is what we need to do once we get a property under contract and whatnot. So our project manager will get involved during the acquisition stage. She look at the video and just kind of say, okay, you know, this rehab is going to be forty to fifty thousand, just so that acquisition manager has some idea on like what numbers to negotiate on. Absolutely, dude, I love that. Yes. So I'm going to have you back on in a couple months because I really, really, really want to talk, you know, in more depth about the software you're developing. Right. Don't, let's not get into it today. Sure. It's not ready, but. One thing that I really picked up from you, you probably don't even know it, and I've been trying to implement in my own business, is so we, we do wholesale, we do rehab, and we do rental. We do all three, right? And a lot of times we'll think, oh, we're going to make 30 grand on this rehab project. But we've owned the property for seven months, and we used a private lender to buy it. Right. And we might owe 10 grand in interest. And if it's right. paid on the back end, you don't even know until – you know, unless you're proactive, but you don't know until closing and then you get the payoff from the lender. Right. So one of the things that your system was, does really well is it helps track the duration, which a yeah. lot of people forget. Yeah. You know, a lot no. of people get the big picture. They look at the numbers. Like I bought for 60, I put 20 in it. I'm selling for 110, 60 no, plus dude. 20 is 80, 80 to 110. That's 30 grand in profit. Yeah, but if you're paying no, ten out, so we have been really focusing lately yeah. on making sure these projects aren't sitting for a week right. or, two or seven. Yeah, no, for us working on them. Go ahead. Yeah, like every day. So on our flip, basically the way we look at it, every day somebody is not working on it, it's costing us hundred dollars. Right. Every single day. Every so day, now, Saturday, now, Sunday, you name it. Right. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, when we buy it, let's say if I have, if I get a bid from my plumber, and this is very important, you know, for your listener, it's very important. Something what happens is, let's say if I get a bid from a plumber today, right? He gives me a bid of $2,500, but he cannot start for two weeks. I get another bid from a guy who's going to do it for $3,000, but it's going to start today. We'll go with the $3,000 guy. Yeah. Because the twenty five hundred dollar guy is going to people. They don't look at it. That they don't. They don't, man. They don't. I mean, like that. That's that's real money that's costing you. Another thing we do in our rental businesses that you know, again, I don't want to get into the software part of it, but like there is, I, I bet there is like very, 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 very small percentage of investors that are actually tracking. So you own a bunch of rental properties, right? So, so for for me personally, it's very important. Like I know, I just don't want to know when did my property get vacant and when it's you know when a tenant came in because that's just part of the story. I want to know. So basically, we divide our vacancy in three buckets. So once a tenant moves out, then our property is sitting vacant, nobody is working on it. Then our the contractor start working on it, then it's listed on the market. So our total vacancy might be sixty days. But I want to I want to know how did it break in those three buckets. Did it, did it just sit there for 30 days before somebody started working on it? If that's the case, then I know we need another rehab group. Right. And if you don't know the numbers, you can't you don't, improve. Yeah, you know, right. So you, you don't have, have that data. That. Exactly. If you don't yeah. have that data. Yeah. And same thing, like what if a property is sitting on the market on average for 45 days before we find it? And then, then I can go to my property manager and say, I think we're asking too much for rent. If our listing is on the market for 45 days, then we're asking too much for rent. 
then you can start making those decisions. And you can make those yeah. adjustments and those decisions, exactly. but without having good data, yep. you're just guessing. So yeah, you, that's you one are. thing that I picked up whenever you kind of gave me the demo of, of the software, right. which again, we're going to circle back to that. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's slick. I can't wait to, to, to do it. Bummed, man. Play with that as well. So yeah. we'll, we'll definitely do that. Right. So you have to sum it all up. Um, I do want to ask you one piece of information that's a little bit more private, but you're, you're not going to care. How much is your bill a month for Pat Live? And the only reason that I ask is we've used them in the past. They are good. They're really great, actually. Um, but obviously, the more usage, the, more, the, the higher the cost. Right. Every call is going to them. So right. are you spending five or 600 a month or less? Or? Uh, I would say on average, it's about 800 to 1,000. Okay, so it's high. It's really yeah. high. I mean, ours. I thought the bill was high at three or four hundred, but right. again, we we didn't. We only had them doing it, you know, after hours and on the weekends. So you know, fifty percent right. yeah. of the time, right? right? So you're spending a lot there. However, but they take the flip all side all. is say that again. They take every single call. every call. That's every what I'm call. saying, right. right? And then you guys call. You either have your acquisition manager or your VA, you know, call and set those appointments. Right. Versus spend a lot of time. So those calls are probably not very long. They're probably shorter, but you get a ton of them though. Even people that right. say, take me off the list. That's right. I mean, some, some months it's a lot higher. You know, I mean, what happens is like when you first drop your mail, like first time you're sending someone, that's when you're going to get a bunch of calls. And the second, third time, the numbers start going down, but hopefully you're getting more quality callers and less volume. So right. that's, well, but yeah, I mean, I, I think on average it runs about like 800 to 1,000 bucks a month. Okay. And yeah. I appreciate you answering that. I'm not trying to get into the personal items within the no, business. It's, it's but, that's a, but that's a good question to ask because, again, if you're new to this, you know, like I think Pat Live has like 100 or $150 minimum right. a month. And you get a lot of the minutes. And then once you go over, and there's right. probably different packages that I'm right. unaware of. But once you go over, you start paying per minute or whatnot. So that's I was just curious because – you are sending a lot of mail. You said thirty to 40,000 pieces roughly every six months. Um, so that's a lot. Every six weeks. Six weeks. Right. I apologize. Yeah. Every six weeks. Um, but that's a lot of mail. That's a really lot. That's a, bi that's a big amount. So I would imagine that you have really, really high call volume. So are you happy with them? Yeah, we're happy with them. I mean, honestly, I haven't tried another service, so I, I have no reference point. I like the fact that they're 24-7. Yeah, like, me too. For example, last year, we wholesaled a property where the, the lady called in on Saturday at 9 o'clock in the evening, right? There, there, there would have been nobody would have picked up that call from right. Right? right? So, Pat Life picked up. You know, we got an email from them saying, hey, this lady wants to sell. She just wants her more cash payoff. And this was in an like, A-class neighborhood. So my acquisition manager went to the appointment the next day, uh, you know, got the deal done and we bought it for 80,000 and we sold it for 140 as is. Boom. So that's a I, I don't deal know. there. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic deal. But I don't know if that deal would have happened had Pat Life not picked up that call. You know, so. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You got to be right. quick sometimes. You exactly. So I don't know in that case, the seller was attached to, hey, I just want to sell it to these guys. I'm not going to pick up the next postcard and call the next person. So, but I've heard from some people that Pat Life could be slow to respond. You know, sometimes they could take like five, six drinks to pick up the phone. So I don't know. We get a bunch of hangups and stuff. So I don't know if, if that's Pat Life or that's just the nature of the business. You know, you're getting some sellers. They pick up the phone, they call, and then eh, I changed my mind. Are you doing anything to the, to the people that hang up? Is that data recorded anywhere or no? Yes, it is. So, so even if somebody hangs up, we get an email that somebody hung up or then if, if they just they just call and before anybody picks up, they hang up. Then we get it and miss calls. So we'll call them back and follow. But yeah. but you know, I mean, you know, in, in the nature of the business, set, like it's so hard. Sometimes these people will sound super super motivated. Like, hey, I want to sell. I want to sign the contract today, right now. When you try to call them back, they're just they're gone. They're nowhere to be found. They're nowhere yeah. to be found. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that happens, man. That's, that's something everybody deals with. But you know, it's nothing unique to us. Right. Well, Sherrod, thanks for coming on. You have provided tremendous amount of value. I, I usually don't have um, an, an episode title until the end. And sure. I think I might name this one time is money because yeah. you've talked a ton about how to remove yourself from the business. 
right. really more not not so much business really more the market in which you're working which right. is awesome but there's a couple good gold nuggets in there about you know not letting these projects sit because there's money that's being spent when they are and, and your calculation is you know roughly a hundred dollars a day right every vacancy for every property that's well, maybe not vacancies but properties that are sitting right. that aren't being worked on or they're not right. being listed one last question for you um, so you both you had mentioned earlier that both the office manager and the project manager are licensed real estate agents acquisition so, and project manager acquisition and office, not manager. the project manager the office no. No, no, no. The acquisition manager and the project manager, they're both licensed agents. Got it. Okay. So then my question was, license. Okay. My question was, do you have them help on the disposition side? Are they listing this and you're paying them fixed costs? Do you have a relationship with the real estate agent? You know, commissions so, are expensive. We talked about that earlier. Are you doing anything to kind of minimize or cut that cost? No. So for any flip that we put on the market my project manager would get that listing so she's licensed real estate agent so she would list it at four and a half percent right and, okay, cool. when, and so that there you go so you're paying four and a half percent right to the project manager is that correct correct okay to the project manager so they're keeping one and a half roughly maybe 1.7 or something but, like they're paying yeah like after paying the broker yeah one right one point seven yeah Right. Okay. Cool, man. So I love it. Like their, I guess bonus because my project man, she puts her heart and soul in the project. I mean, our, our projects are looking absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then our acquisition manager, she gets ten percent of the net profit on every deal. Okay. So that, yeah, that, I wasn't even going to ask that question, but I'm happy that you shared. So they yeah. make ten percent of the net. Right. And then is that person salaried? Are they hourly? To, no, they're, they're straight commission. Straight the commission. Acquisition is straight commission. And so they only make 10%, but it's net, which is yeah. which is good. So they get paid on the back end, I'd assume? So the way we do is so we'll pay them, like when we close on the property, we'll pay them 500 bucks, and then the remainder will be paid. So they get something today, yeah. right, and then later. Now, what if you wholesale? Is it the same thing or is it different? Same thing. Same thing. I love it. Man, that's great. Well, Sherrod, again, thank you so much for coming. I usually do episodes that are 30 to 40 minutes. We went way long, but I'm happy we did because there was sure. a ton of information. Ton awesome, of gold no, thank you for having me, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ton of gold nuggets. If you guys are wanting to uh, you know, learn how to do this virtually, this is the episode for you. Listen to it a couple times. I know I'm going to listen to it again probably this evening, um, but I'm impressed, man. 50, 50 flips in 2018. You have you know, 10 to 15 going at any time. Um, good spreads, and you're only in the market a couple days a month. So right. you, know, you you are a master at automation and delegation, in, in my opinion. And I can't wait. And having a great team, absolutely. Right. But I'm excited to have you back here, uh, hopefully in maybe the next month or two. Yeah. Uh, talk about your software that you're going to be launching. Let's do it, man. Let's do awesome, it. man. Cool. Thank you, well, Sherrod, thank you so much for coming. Guys, if you are new to real estate investing, check out our free wholesale course. It's located at freewholesalecourse.com. And we also just published our book, The Ultimate Guide to Wholesaling Real Estate. It's available on Amazon. Sherrod, thanks again, buddy. We are signing off. Until thanks, next man. time, guys, we will see Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, share, and subscribe to help us reach a wider audience. To jumpstart your real estate investing career, please visit freewholesalecourse.com, the most complete free course on wholesaling real estate ever. We would also appreciate it if you left us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Thank you in advance for your support. And remember, you make your money when you buy and you get paid when you sell. Now let's go build some wealth.